we have different uh, treatment options now for frontline therapy. Uh, the, the field has evolved, uh, and, and we have, uh, fortunately, many ways to treat our patients. So that brings the issue of how do you select uh, between the different treatment options that we have available. So, so Javier, had you, can you tell us a, a little bit of uh, what factors do sure. you consider okay. when you have a new patient and you're trying to decide uh, which of the drugs you're going to use? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, Jorge. As you very well know, I mean, uh, every patient is different, and I think to have like a one only approach for all uh, patients is impossible. So there is no doubt there is uh, several factors that we, uh, I consider, and many of us consider when we really discuss the the, the multiple uh, options for from line therapy. Uh, um, mainly, I mean, age is an important uh, factor in my opinion. Um, also, the, the fact the, the degree of the risk of the disease at presentation, um, how active is this person at the time that he's coming to our clinic? Is it a, you know, a family, a parent, working a patient versus a patient who's retired may have more time? And mainly these are the areas uh, who I discuss. For sure, comorbidities and problems with uh, health as an important factor to consider um, the several tickets that we have available because uh, some of them or all of them may have different uh, toxicity profiles that may or may not really adjust to every patient that we are going to treat with uh, the drugs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very important. And um, <clears throat> I guess in some way connected to this is the uh, is to look at what exactly we're going to what, what's our goal for therapy. Um, we know there's some some differences between what we can achieve with these different drugs in terms of how quickly and how deep and, and all of that. So, um, may I ask you, Harry, what are your goals for therapy? What what goals should we focus on? Uh, in, when we're starting to treat that we, that we need to keep an eye on that, that, uh, that we reach. So, so what, what, do you, what do you look for when you're treating a patient with CML? Well, you know, when I approach a, a patient with CML as a hematologist, an oncologist, my goals um, that I consider are the same as when I'm seeing a patient with any cancer. And the first question I consider is, can I cure this disease um, and extend survival by doing so? If I was only focused on cure, then I think all of our patients would still be undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplant at the time of diagnosis because we're not quite certain yet if anyone will be cured with able uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But clearly we don't do that because of the toxicity uh, of that and, and the lack of, of donors for, for many patients. And so the next thing I consider is how can I extend a person's survival? Well, we've done much better, as, as you know, with the able tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, in the last 10 to 15 years than therapy before, like with interferon. But I'll remind everyone that no randomized trial has shown a survival benefit of an able TKI over prior therapies because these therapies become available and patients can switch. Um, Gleevec and Matnib has set the bar very high in terms of survival. So if it's not survival, then what is it? And for me, the most important goal is the prevention of progression to accelerate phase and blast crisis. And it's really important for the community oncologist to know that when we're talking about progression, we're not talking about um, losing a response and the white count goes up again and then you have time to find another able TKI. Progression means that the biology of the disease has changed, the outcome of these patients is worse, their survival is worse, they are facing decisions about allogeneic transplant in that, um, in that uh, position. And when patients progress to accelerate phase or blast crisis, their median survival is about 10 months. And that's been shown in the IRIS trial and, and SND and, and other data sets. So pre prevention of progression becomes the most important goal in, in my book. And uh, treating patients with an agent that they can tolerate to do that is important. The value of all of this discussion about cytogenetic responses and molecular responses we need to remember really is the value of those endpoints, those uh, um, response criteria in, a, in preventing progression down the road. So I would say for me, it's prevention of progression to accelerate phase and blast crisis. Getting rid of leukemic stem cell to, to, to finish with is not necessarily what I'm interested in. Um, and we may not be able to do it with an able tyrosine kinase inhibitor. To put it in a more practical term, I am not looking for all of my patients to become negative 
uh, um, on a uh, well-done quantitative PCR, whether we call that an MR 4.5, or with these new digital PCRs that can detect even lower amounts of disease. We, can't, we shouldn't focus on that. We should focus on the responses that have correlated with and have been associated with a lower rate of progression. Yeah, I think that's an important point. We, we need to remember that these response criteria are surrogate markers for surrogate. these for, important for, for, endpoints. And, uh, and we need to you know, aim for a good response, but not, you know, uh, not being PCR negative is not, is not necessarily a, a failure. So, yeah, very, very important points.